And let us offer our prayer to St. Jude. St. Jude, glorious apostle, faithful servant and friend of Jesus, the name of the traitor has caused you to be forgotten by many. But the church honors and invokes you universally as the patron of difficult and desperate cases. Pray for me who am in need of God's mercy. Make use, I implore you, of that particular privilege accorded to you to bring visible and speedy help where help was almost despaired of. Come to my assistance in this great need that I may receive the consolation and help of heaven in all my necessities, tribulations, and sufferings particularly. And that I may praise God with you and all the elect throughout all eternity. I promise you, O blessed Jude, to be ever mindful of this great favor. I will honor you as my special and powerful patron and encourage devotion to you. St. Jude, pray for us and for all who honor and invoke thy aid. The king was deeply distressed, but because of his oaths and the guests, he did not wish to break his word to her. King Herod was a man who lacked temperance and indulged in his lusts. It leads him to marrying his brother's wife while his brother was still alive and after divorcing his own. It led to drunken banquets with his officials for his birthday. It led to lust after Herodias' daughter. His passions so inflamed that he's willing to give her half his kingdom for a dance. But lust is not his final downfall. It is his pride. He is superstitiously concerned for himself and what might happen if he breaks an oath. He is worried what his courtiers, his military officers, and the leading men of Galilee will think of him. For the sake of his pride, he's willing to commit murder. Murder of a man that he knows to be righteous and holy. Herod is often juxtaposed to King David by the fathers of the church. At one point, King David swore by the Lord to kill Nabal, a foolish and ungrateful man, and to destroy all his possessions. But when Nabal's wife, Abigail, recalls God's promises to David, he quickly took back his threats, put his sword in its scabbard, and did not feel that he had contracted any guilt by thus breaking his oath. A rash oath is itself evil, and there is no good in fulfilling it. King David certainly committed his share of sin, notably again murder, in order to cover his lust. But David remained humble. David would quickly confess his guilt, would submit to the Lord's penance, and would mourn over his sins in ways that often left his courtiers, his military officers, and the leading men of his time confused because they did not seem very kingly. David let go of his pride and humbled himself. And the Lord forgave him his sins and exalted his strength forever. One of the most important virtues of Our Lady that we are called to imitate is her profound humility. Humility is, in many ways, the most fundamental of the virtues. Because 
We only seek after the other virtues if in humility we can recognize our need for maturity and perfection. And yet, as we have seen this week, one of the best ways to come to understand a virtue is to understand what it is not. Coming to a better understanding of the vice of pride first, we can then come to a better understanding of humility. Now, in English, we use the word pride in various ways, and not all of them are bad. But when we're talking about pride in the context of vice and sin, we mean a kind of pride that is always a distortion of reality. It is a desire for preeminence that is not ours to have, an exaltation in something that is beyond us. Pride is insidious. And it comes in multiple forms. In its highest form, it can reject everything that is not my good. Because all good outside of me is a threat to my preeminence. This is the pride of Satan. Though perhaps we've encountered others whose pride very closely resembles it. Not far from this is a form of pride that does not reject all good outside of myself, but only rejects the supreme good of our Creator and Sovereign Lord. Because it simply does not want to be subservient to anyone. And this pride has plagued man throughout history and can often be found ingrained in various pagan or anti-religious positions. There are many lesser forms of pride as well. From a complacency that presumes I'm really great and the source of my own greatness with regards to my morals or intellect or talents or good looks, or in my case, all of the above. And by the way, I'd really appreciate it if you noticed There's a haughtiness or a social pride that realizes maybe I'm not so great. But I'll be darned if anybody finds out. I work very hard to keep up appearances, and even though I know I was wrong, I am not about to admit it by asking for forgiveness. Pride, of course, can even work its way into an otherwise perfectly good act. As I feel the need to tell you just how much I volunteer with the homeless, or feel so very pleased that I spent so much more time in prayer yesterday than the rest of you. Pride can even work its way into what we think is humility. We can adopt A very false humility in which I make terribly harsh judgments against myself that are not really mine to make. And against all of that, we look to the humility of Mary. Mary, who knows who she is, that she is a mere creature created by God and so has no difficulty submitting herself to his authority. Mary, who knows her innocence and yet expresses no concern over what others might think of her pregnancy. Mary, who has just been made the mother of God and yet does not hesitate to travel swiftly to serve her cousin Elizabeth. To overcome our pride, we need to imitate Mary. We need to recognize who we are and then gladly submit to the proper authority of God. Recognizing we need to seek His forgiveness. 
We need to be ready to serve Him. Humility means being able to admit when I am wrong and accept the consequences. But it also means not being very concerned or upset about perceived injustices done to me. And humility is always ready to serve others and even to be served by others. Not because I deserve it, but because that's how love works. We are all in need of love and help in this world. Humility admits that and allows love to flow through mutual service. The most important practice of humility is actually just prayer. It is that constant raising of our hearts and minds to God, who is our sovereign Lord, who created me and sustains me and has given me every good gift. And so there is a second principal virtue of Our Lady for today. Her continual prayer. A continual prayer that maintained and expressed that profound humility before the Lord. A continual prayer that kept her free from sin. A continual prayer that brought her ever deeper into the wonders and the mysteries of her Son. And a continual prayer that burns with charity for our needs. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of the Father, humbled Himself and became one of us in Mary's womb. And humbled Himself again in submitting to an unjust death at our hands. He humbles Himself even more by becoming our very food and drink, our spiritual sustenance. May we learn to overcome and root out our pride by imitating Our Lady's profound humility and her continual prayer. That through her intercession, we might also encounter the humility of her most holy Son. And so let us offer our novena prayer to the Virgin Mary. O Immaculate Virgin Mary, Mother of Mercy, you are the refuge of sinners, the health of the sick, and the comfort of the afflicted. You know my wants, my troubles and my sufferings. By your appearance at the Grotto of Lourdes, you made it a privileged sanctuary where your favors are given to people streaming to it from the whole world. Over the years, countless sufferers have obtained the cure for their infirmities, whether of soul, mind, or body. Therefore, I come to you with St. Jude as my patron, to implore your motherly intercession. Obtain, O loving Mother, the grant of my requests. Through gratitude for your favors, I will endeavor to imitate your virtues, that I may one day share in your glory. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.